Good morning. Uh, my name is Michael Cortez. I'm Filipino. <laughs> Although I'm, uh, I reside in Japan, uh, I used to be I used to teach at De La Salle University, Manila, and now I moved to Japan. I'm the, I'm a full-time university professor uh, at Ritsumeikan Asia Pacific University, and uh, I'm the deputy director of our uh, the Ritsumeikan Center for Asia Pacific Studies. In the center, one of our core uh, research themes is tourism, inclusive leadership, and many other emerging themes in the Asia Pacific region. Uh, how did I get into tourism? <laughs> I'm a non resident fellow of Asian Institute of Management, uh, Center for Tourism, and I organize conferences of the Asia Pacific Business and Economics Research Society. It, 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 it travels around uh, the Asia Pacific region where uh, we, we present academic literature on, uh, on uh, themes such as tourism. Meanwhile, let me ask, uh, since many students here are, I'm sure you're a millennial, so who has an IG account? Don't be shy. Okay. You don't have IG accounts? <laughs> so you have an IG account. Um, of course, you have a Snapchat. You have a Facebook, definitely. That's how you communicate and, uh, and chat with everybody. But basically, uh, I asked because uh, it, it, I, I designed this presentation to appeal to millennials to sell the idea of how do we frame heritage tourism within ecotourism in the country. Well, of course, the title is The Readiness of, of, of Cities and of Infrastructures that are Needed to Support Tourism Activities of, of, of the Country, of, of the City. But then again, uh, where do we frame heritage tourism? I presented this in the Intramuros Development Board, um, Intramuros um, uh, in, in Letran, in, in, in at De La Salle, and other uh, um, institutes for sustainability study. But basically, uh, if I were to summarize my presentation, it's about accepting the fact that the Philippines is seen as a one large beach. Okay? It's a beach destination. And how we would frame heritage would be a subset or a sub factor of how um, heritage, uh, how tourism is going to be packaged. So, uh, oh, yeah, okay, let me start with this presentation. So, this is uh, in Koron. It's actually a cliche of all the things you post on Instagram, right? <laughs> all, your, all your aerial shots, all your, you know, swimming by the beach shot or walking away. And here's another one that looks much like it.
So I was just up at Koron the two weeks ago, and last weekend I was in Chargao. So that's what I do every school break. Uh, I travel, and uh, I like traveling a lot. <laughs> I do research on travel. Uh, so I presented in these countries just to overemphasize that I like to travel a lot. So this is the academic society I, I, I host. I like business studies, accounting, finance, economics, and sustainability. Basically, my, if you Google me up on Google Scholar, you'd find my sustainability studies on manufacturing. But how did I end up in tourism? Basically, I overexploited the themes on, on manufacturing, sustainable manufacturing, green manufacturing already, that I thought I would explore something else closer to me or very, uh, to which I'm very much personally invested in, and that is my, my country, the Philippines. And that's why I am in tourism studies. I like to travel with my friends. I like to travel with my family. I like to travel a lot alone. <laughs> I also like to travel with my students, with my colleagues from De La Salle, my colleagues from uh, Ritsumeikan Asia Pacific Studies. I travel with my nephews and nieces uh, when we visit these things, making it fun and educational family trips. So formally now. <laughs> Our, my objective here is to present a conceptual framing of heritage tourism within the context of sustainable tourism. Secondly, heritage tourism is a subset of e ecotourism. We will identify the key variable, which Ms. Lim has already pinpointed earlier, but later I will try to put a framework because you as students, when you eventually write your research and you eventually write your thesis, you would need frameworks conceptual frameworks, operational frameworks, to put together these things. And I'm sure the LGUs know it very well already, and of course our industry partners know that as well, that they, they provide you with data, they provide you with information, but how do you put information together? You would need a framework. And uh, uh, finally, we will look into the benefits and challenges in a multi-stakeholder approach. So, uh, right. So this is the idea of every foreigner about the Philippines. It's a beach. Uh, in, in, on our, in our university, we have around 90 countries represented. It's an international university. And every uh, summer and spring break, I bring my students here for a sustainable tourism class, even sustainable fashion class. So we travel, and definitely they get to experience the beaches in the Philippines. And uh, it's my opportunity to teach them uh, tourism as well. Here are some models of sustainability uh, by Stuart Hart in his book Beyond Greening Strategies for a Sustainable World. We can see here the market economy, nature economy, survival economy. If we are to frame the Philippines, probably we are here in the survival economy and the nature economy. Therefore, our tourism strategies are limited to sustainable use of nature economy, replenishment of depleted resources and to foster village-based business relationships or uh, community-based uh, relationships. Um, at, in the middle are, you know, are, is our theme, you know, mega cities. How do mega cities ad adopt to tourism? Uh, we're not touching on poverty and pollution at this point. Probably we are here in the resource depletion. If we start from the with the right foot saying that the Philippines is a beach. So the Philippines is a beach, therefore we, are, we have a nature economy, yet how do we preserve that? Then maybe we are looking at the survival economy. Well, market economies are usually uh, Japan, Korea, China, Australia, Guam, Taiwan, America, European countries. Tourists are on their own and facilities are built, it's safe. They can take public transport, you go to Osaka, you, you experience cuisine, you go to the places you see on Instagram or Facebook or just Google it up, ask Google things to do in Osaka and then it already tells you what to do. That is the market economy. Uh, in uh, nature economy, there's, we have Vietnam, Philippines and the main product is basically ecotourism. You go there and then you experience Okay, hospitality, you experience the food, and you keep coming back for more, and that is heritage tourism. That is when heritage tourism comes in. It becomes the flavor of the experience. It, it sweetens the deal. It's the icing on the cake. It's the, it's the, it's the cream over your frappuccino. <laughs> 
It's the, it's the ice cream on your halo-halo. <laughs> okay, plus more. <laughs> but basically, uh, you experience heritage, culinary, history. That is uh, nature economy. And then moving on is survival economy, where some countries have a dark side of tourism, slum tours, poverty tourism, immersion programs, social enterprises. But they don't go there basically for, for that primary purpose. You, know, you, be, you become in, more interested in a country as you get to know its people, as you get to know the food, the country, the religion, the experience that you keep coming back for more. But this is an example of a survival economy that they, they, some fishermen in, in Oslo have had to you know, feed the, the, the whale sharks so that they stay there. They, they become pets and become tourist attractions, but it's now being questioned as to its sustainability. So th this is a framework that I have been using all along, and I hope many of you will also use. You may Google him up, Bjork. So Bjork uses the ecotourism model where there is an interaction between authorities, tourists, tourism businesses, and the local community. Um, in another framework with uh, Dr. John Paulo Rivera, my co-author, we have revised it in the Sustainable Tourism Framework, which we have presented in many different forums, but we'll go back to that in a short while. Meanwhile, uh, as uh, Ms. Lim presented earlier about the stakeholders, we can uh, plug in all the multi-stakeholders here, looking into the authorities, tourism businesses, the tourists themselves, and local community. That's why I asked the, the, the students, do you have an IG account? Of course, you have an IG account. And before you go, when you go to a particular destination, like I was in Shargao with my daughter last weekend, and she said, we want to go to this uh, bent uh, coconut tree. And I said, why do you want to go to that bent coconut tree? There are like millions of coconuts in the island. Why that particular coconut tree? And she said, because it is the most Instagrammable place on Corregidor Island in Shargao. I said, okay, let's go to find the bent coconut tree. So basically the tourist interaction with uh, there's interaction between tourist businesses and tourist uh, authorities and local community. Um, tourists get to experience, immerse with local life, appreciation of local culture. So in this quadrant, we have food tourism, volunteerism, and cultural exchange. Well, it's Bjork's model, but it's actually my model together with Dr. Rivera because we've already expounded on what are the possibilities for tourists' interaction with local community. They experience food. They get stuck there after a typhoon, they volunteer. Or probably they don't leave. I, uh, I arrived in Shargao last week and somebody was carrying an iMac, a tourist guy who had an iMac, and probably he really planned to stay there for a long time, otherwise he would have just brought a, a phone or a laptop, but an iMac, personal computer, means somebody plans to stay there for a long time. Tourist businesses and the local community, of course, they have to, we have to deal with transportation, hotels and restaurants, tour operators, and allied services. Between authorities and tourists, we look into immigration, tourist assistance, and probably the promotion of heritage tourism. Between authorities and tourist businesses, we have, of course, the environmental taxes, infrastructure, development, certification. Outside the quadrant are environmental regulations, immersion with local life, provision of employment and livelihood, and taxation, quality monitoring, and environmental regulations. So we plug in all these uh, stakeholders in, uh, um, according to Bjork's, these are the four, but of course, according to, to you, you may add some NGOs and special purpose organizations to, 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 to probably between businesses and local communities. In the next framework I will show you, we show that um, in some areas, there is weak presence of the authorities and, and uh, interaction with local community. In the academe, when we have a broken line, we show that there is weak relationship. But of course, uh, our experience in Iloilo is, is one of the regarded best practices. Um, even in, 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 in our university, we look into oh, one village, one product. We look in one town, one product. And Iloilo has always been a, a good example of the strong relationship between local communities and the local authority. 
But generally speaking, yeah, I've been testing this. That's why I, I traveled to Coron, I traveled to Siargao, I've been to Puerto Princesa and many other uh, look, sites, tourist sites. Um, in a way, this relationship is weak, okay? Which, which, which needs a lot of improvement because we need to strengthen this looking, because the authorities don't just need to do uh, business environmental taxes, but build the infrastructure. If there's no infrastructure, how do you even promote tourism? There's not even a road going there. Or um, there should be certification and quality monitoring and environmental regulations. The local community, on the other hand, can have community-based tourism model. They can promote heritage tourism, ecotourism, and food tourism. These are all the allied services and direct, direct and indirect tourism businesses and their interaction with tourists. Likewise, it is mediated by the relationship based on their expectations from the media and the internet. Before you go to Shargao, you Google up, where's the cliff to dive? Don't do that. <laughs> there's, no, there's no rescue, okay? Or uh, where's this, uh, where is this rock on Koron? I have to go there. I have to see, I have to take a picture at Kayangan Lake, like that. So, it's, you know, there is a, a large expectation set or mediated by the media and the internet that, that uh, allow tourists and tourist businesses to interact. But basically, uh, in our presentations at the Department of Tourism, we say that tourism is basically private initiated. But of course, there is an importance, uh, the authorities are equally important, and the local community has an emerging role in sustaining tourism in the Philippines and in the locality. If we are to define heritage tourism, uh, we, it's, it is a subset concerned with the country, region, culture, specifically the lifestyle of people in a geographic area, their history, art, religion, and other elements that shape their lives. I had an, uh, an atheist friend, and he said, oh, I like Thailand. They have, they have spectacular mosques. And my reply was, oh, we have spectacular churches. <laughs> so, you know, our churches are, are awesome. They're, pre, they're, they're, you know, they date back to hundreds of years ago. So, traveling to experience the places and activities that authentically represent the stories of people of the past and the present, and it includes visiting irreplaceable historic, cultural, and natural resources. So, these are the key variables for heritage tourism. We look into the personal characteristic. The person has to be interested in the heritage or into humanity, somebody who, who, who would appreciate food, somebody who would, experience, who, uh, who would appreciate the experience more than just dipping their toes on, on sand and water, but to, the, the entire experience. Site attributes, what's in the site aside from the bent coconut tree? The Japanese are very good in putting site attributes. And we say in heritage studies, if the, if the, if the heritage is not there, build the heritage, make a story. You know, in, in, there are some caves uh, in Japan where they put a Buddha, they put something there just to put an attraction. And it, they're very good in, in building a heritage so that, you know, when you're just driving along and you will say, okay, there's a, there's a waterfall there. Oh, there's a cave there. It, it's all in the local community or local government map uh, on the on, uh, tourist sites. Awareness, perceptions, and behavior modification. So. Uh, Awareness is raised at this level because, you know, you Google up, okay, what's there in Shargao, what's there in Koron, and what are your perceptions after the experience, your behavior modification. So this is me climbing uh, the, the Batad rice terraces. Um, there was a grant from Tieza where Dr. Rivera and I climbed the Batad ter rice terraces beside the uh, Banawi rice terraces only to find out that the Banawi rice terraces is, is just a jeepney ride away, five minutes from the hotel. We didn't have to hike up. <laughs> but anyway, um, this is uh, my Taiwanese friend who joined me, the, joined the hike, and we, we, we did this uh, five years ago in our early 40s, and we swore never to do it again. <laughs> uh, this is uh, my buddy, Dr. Gian Paolo Rivera, who had a an economic dilemma, dilemma whether to fall face front into mud or fall off the cliff. What would have been your decision? 
<laughs> so basically, uh, when we're looking, uh, I use this slide all the time, when we ask for the personal characteristic, because when we entered the Banat, Batad rice terraces, nobody told us that the, that the climb would be four hours going up. And we just asked the tour guide, how long does it take? He just, a few steps. And we said, how many is a few steps? He said, maybe 200. <laughs> and then we, I was counting 175, and I said, it's already 175, how many more? He said, maybe two hours more. <laughs> but, but that's him, I'm not blaming him though. But you see, it was death defying actually, and I was still, oops, time is up. Let me just be, quickly finish this up. So, uh, that's me after the climb, and I hated it. At least I survived. This is, uh, these are opportunities for heritage tourism in the Philippines. Once they know we have cockfighting, then maybe they, we can, we can uh, promote that kind of tour. Um, in, in, other, in South America, they have slum tours. There are cemetery tours. There's historical tours, religious tours, and culinary tour, tours. It depends on the personal characteristic on who is interested. Basically, uh, my point is heritage is the second time around. It's the, sweet, it's the, the, it's the deal sweetener. So uh, this is Halong Bay in Japan and I didn't, in Vietnam, and I didn't like it because they made it shining, shimmering, splendid with all the Disney lights, which is a no-no in the, in the underground river of, uh, of Palawan because we have an environmental carrying capacity there. But still, they lit it up so that it looks fancy for a picture. But no, it's not impressive. These are my students uh, when we tour in uh, last, last class picture. Uh, it promotes employment, develops businesses, enhance property values, generate revenues for local government, and preserve the community's unique character and identity. So these are the challenges ahead. Community participation, as raised by Ms. Lim, what's in it for them? And this might be a little controversial, but I was in Koron and Shargao. Uh, I'm sorry, Shargao, but Shargao is in a losing end. You know, it's not ready. While we're talking about the readiness of, uh, of uh, country of the country, readiness of cities, Manila, tourists go through Manila, tourists go through the actual destination, but I would not recommend Shargao to a friend because the hospital is not ready. The, I would, I'm not saying I agree with Yang Constantino, right? <laughs> she shouldn't have ranted on, on social media, but I, I knew the risks I was getting into. When I was there, there's no rescue, there's no, you know, enter at your own risk when I did my spelunking. So, harmony and interdependencies between community and tourism goals, environmental caring capacity, sustainability of the resource base, planning and marketing heritage, built heritage tourism. We can talk about that in the question and answer when there is time. Meanwhile, there's another time is up. Just to summarize, uh, okay, uh, this is uh, my expectations versus reality. How do you do that? This is my augmented reality. Get the best tour guide. And the tour guide will really make sure you get to counter flow the flow of tourists and you get to get a picture where there's nobody else but you. So uh, challenges ahead, community participation. This picture-perfect Instagrammable moment is courtesy of this guy who cleaned up the beach. So it's not always perfect. Somebody is cleaning it. I always tell my tourism students, this perfect photo is courtesy of this guy. So harmony and interdependencies in uh, Koron, while there's an overflow of tourists, they are organized so everyone will help you cross the line of boats. It's okay, they will help you. but. Sorry, this is my daughter, and uh, before I took this aerial shot, boats were just parking in any which way in Shargao. <laughs> Regardless whether you're swimming there or not, but they will park no matter what. So there is no designated areas in that particular beach. Environmental carrying capacity, we can talk about that later. And then sustainability of the resource base. I'll probably just end here because there's already the time is up uh, signal. But my point is that it's the people. These are my favorite tour guides, Bebang and, uh, and uh, Renz. They're, they're the sweetest tour guides, and they make me keep on coming back, learning about the Tagbanwas, learning about, about Kulyon, learning more and more and more about history and culture of, of the Tagbanwas in Koron. And uh, that's why it's the people that matters, and um, community participation is very important. Um, heritage tourism is the deal sweetener. It's the ice cream on your halo-halo. Thank you very much.